In the process of getting where we are tonight, a great many of us have lost our sense of proportion. We have wrapped ourselves in self-righteousness and have let our voices become shrill and loud and have let passions overcome our reason. One sizable group of responsible individuals has demanded the resignation of John Newton because of what they considered his bad judgment and deficiencies in administrative ability. Another sizable group of responsible individuals has demanded that John Newton not resign because they believe his leadership has resulted in, in an unusually good high school in terms of its preparation of students for life in a highly complicated and competitive modern civilization. Please. Pete, do you have basketball practice tonight? Uh, yeah. We'll be late from 7 to 9. You'll have to wait till the school board meeting is over and come home with me. I told Joanne and Margie that we were going to pick them up around 7 o'clock this morning on our way to school. going on at Leland and Gray. I know what some of your problems are with respect to administration, but I'm very sympathetic to your headmaster, your principal, because I know that it is one thing to enunciate the philosophy of education and another thing to make it a reality in the actual process of teaching. I think a lot of people are worried that we're going to expose their children to experiences that are foreign to the parents, and the parents feel that somehow they probably wouldn't approve, or they might not approve. And they respond to that by, by saying, we don't want any change. We don't, we don't want, we want, we want it the old way. We want it the way it was when we were in school, because they survived that, and they feel that it must be OK. For one thing, I feel it's important that the basics should be, uh, you should have them every day. And these other things, like drama, art, et cetera, music, they're the frosting on the cake, see? Uh, they're the carrot in front of the donkey, you know, that keeps him going and gives him a little interest, spurs him on. Uh, much, much of Today, education is not the slate pencil in the slate. Today, Education is a far broader uh, experience than just the three R's. There is a conflict of two ideologies. Uh, you have 
the people who set a great deal of value by the basics in, in education. Uh, and then you have the people who are uh, seeking always something new, new methods, and so forth. And these new methods, uh, sad to say, haven't always proved to be very effective. People are always worried about change. Change is, is uncomfortable. It's, 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 uh, the unknown is always kind of frightening for people. And so if the schools try to change to respond to the, the needs that they see in society, then there's going to be controversy. Okay, so they're really tenant farmers, except the tenant farmers paying rent in money. In our school, kids are generally quite relaxed, and this is a very important issue in the controversy. One side believes that in school you should not be, you should not be relaxed, whereas on the, other, on the other side believes that the best atmosphere for learning is, is, a, is a relaxed atmosphere. That side we have to add it over here to keep it balanced. I think it's gone beyond educational issues. I think it's just they're arguing about anything they can think of to argue about, just for the sake of arguing. And now, I'll change that to fourths, and how many fourths have you got there? They're fighting over, over who's going who's gonna to control the school, who's going to get the, uh, the most influence in how the school's going to be run. Being as good as everybody else, or better than, or worse than, or I'm good at this, or I'm terrible at this. Where does it all come from? I think the people around here are just so wrapped up in their own opinions that they're just beyond thinking okay. about what it's going to well, do to the kids and how it's going to affect us. Das Bild des Ases gesehen. When you're changing such an important institution, it, it's, it's, going, it's going to have tremendous repercussions on the kids. And for me personally, I, uh, it, whatever happens will have a tremendous effect on my whole life. It's very hard for me to uh, continue in, in school and, and keep my head um, on my work and uh, not be too adversely affected by the controversy that's going on around me. It affects me to the point where I just, I don't know which direction to head in or where to go, and I'm, it really confuses me. Mainly, I think the people feel it is more urgent to, uh, to voice their opinion than to get a good education for their children. What people don't realize when they uh, do things to their kids' education is that they're not just affecting the kids, they're affecting the society. And uh, they don't realize this. Well, good morning. Mr. Newton, I'd like you to meet Arthur Wiskow. Mr. Wiskow, this is John Newton. He's principal of the high school. How do you do, sir? I'd like to introduce you to Arthur Wiskow. I'm delighted that you've asked me here today to share with you some thoughts on the controversy which seems to be affecting your school and your community. Such confrontations are by no means uncommon. Schools have always been the focus of controversy. In the New England colonies, only a few young people attended school for more than two or three years. 
Those who did studied Latin in preparation for college, in which Latin was the only language spoken or written. Benjamin Franklin said that he saw little value in the Latin school curriculum and made the heretical assumption that students should enjoy school. During the late 1700s, towns and villages began growing in size, trade and commerce increased, and it became apparent that the classical Latin education was no longer appropriate for preparing young people to engage in the new occupations demanded by the changing society. In the 1800s, school reformers claimed that the schools were too strict and argued for a more sympathetic attitude toward children. In 1893, a group known as the Committee of Ten charged that the schools were not strict enough. Almost immediately, people began to criticize the Committee of Ten. Writers asserted that the schools were merely places of detention. Setting children free to learn became the rallying cry of progressive educators. The pendulum swung once again. The time is 9.15. I received a letter from a distraught woman telling me about her high school aged daughter. It seems that the daughter is a good student, but has one problem. She cannot read. Oh, sure, she can read her school books. But they are so simple as to be foolish, the mother writes. Well, this is not an isolated incident. I have spoken many times of the confusion in our schools where quality education has become a rarity, if not a lost cause. Today's teachers seem to believe that schools should be entertaining and not enlightening, casual and not challenging. In the 1940s, new criticisms began to be heard. Schools were too soft, and teachers were just letting children play. Many critics demanded a return to the three R's and to a policy of strict discipline and order. The object, after all, is to produce educated men and women, not to reward our youngsters with a diploma for merely growing up. Earl Kelly, in his 1948 book, Education for What is Real, warned that Americans were being led to believe that working on tasks devoid of interest is good discipline, and that making a child conform to a repressive classroom atmosphere will make him want to conform when he gets out of school. Then came October 4th, 1957. That was the day when the Russians launched the first space satellite called Sputnik into Earth orbit. Passing over American skies, the satellite the size of a basketball had an immediate and dramatic impact in this country. Shattered American complacency and attacks on the public schools for their failure to teach the technological subjects followed the news of the successful launch. In the 1960s, students began to question established ways of thinking. While many people criticized the schools for seeming to be more concerned with blue jeans and long hair than with teaching and learning. He thought that long hair didn't look good on boys and that it distracted the class. In the 1970s, with people becoming more vocal about the schools, we had the problem of deciding who speaks for the community and of defining actually what the community is. Borough, hamlet, village, neighborhood, township, magisterial district, special service district, metropolitan area, 
ward, block, school district, city of the first or nth class, trade area, parish, precinct, beat, town, zone, state, region, and section. We have a dictionary full of divisions and subdivisions. And these are all communities of one kind or another. Many of them are formally bounded and charted on maps. Others are invisibly outlined in the social habits of their populations. All of us live simultaneously in several of them. And thus we are faced with the fact that seeking the community simply depends on our definition. Do you see a pendulum effect in American education? Well, you got, you're right on target with that question. I think everybody's quite well aware of the fact that this pendulum swings back and forth you know, we've been over to the, what we call the basics, whatever they are. Some of us are not too sure about that. We've also come the other way to what we call the progressive movement. And we go back the other way to, to something nearer the basics. But right now, we seem to be headed back to a non unknown territory, probably more to the basics than ever before, due to the unemployment, due to the pressure brought to bear upon the schools. And therefore, I'm afraid they're going to take you and everybody else, regardless of what your style and need for a learning style may be, and force you into a mold that will be an extreme. How can we avoid these extremes? Well, I think it would be very simple. I think we ought to quit, get into something the same as we do in the selling of automobiles. I think we ought to give the consumer a choice. I'd like to think that my responsibility as a school administrator should be to furnish to you and to your parents several ways in which you might become educated. And then you take your choice of that, rather than to saying we'll take everybody, package them up, and dip them into something called basics or something called progressives. You have your basic, I'll have my progressive, or I'll have my basic and you have your progressive. Have it any way you want to, and my accountability will be to give you plenty of options from which to make that choice. The community is not homogeneous in any sense. Uh, we have a broad spectrum of people of different backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, different uh, social and economic backgrounds. And one group might think that your leadership is just great, and another group thinks it's just terrible. And that's, that's really where the pinch comes. came to Leland and Gray, I said to the staff, some of which was old, had been there a while, and some of which was recently hired, and I said, how do you feel about the program that you've been doing? Are you happy with that? And nobody was. So the next question is, of course, what are we going to do about it? So we've tried quite a lot of things, and they haven't all been successful, and some of them have been very successful. But almost all of them have been criticized. And so I, I feel that that's my job, is to be in the middle of the controversy. Even though, as I say, I don't always like it. We believe that many of the allegations being made against you are false or misleading. We have personal knowledge of your deep concern for the students, of your close working relationship with the faculty, and of your integrity. We urge you not to resign. Captain Keller, acting faculty secretary. That's the end. Thank you. We'll get the names of the people and their addresses who are the authors of 13 pages of reasons, charges, or allegations. For the record, please. Would the, would the authors of the 13 pages please stand up? I did not author it. charges were not along with it. I want to tell you something. The petition 
Excuse me to direct your answer to the chair. Yes, Mr. Chair. I am the author of the petition. I composed the, the petition. And I signed the petition. This is my request. 540 other people agreed. At the close of that meeting, uh, seeing the reaction of the people and the school board and uh, realizing that uh, everyone had become so concerned with his own viewpoint and his own uh, ideas that he had forgotten uh, really why he was there. Um, is very, uh, was a very depressing thing for me. To the seven or eight members of this board that wrote this letter, and to Mr. Kane, who admits to being the author of this petition, I invite you to come into my classroom and find out what's going on in this school. I don't think that any teacher could have sat through that meeting, any teacher who has spent uh, years in preparation and years of experience in teaching, could have sat through that meeting and not felt like uh, uh, the whole educational process is going down the drain. We have presented our case to the board a long time ago. And I don't know where all you people have been. You had your heads in the sand, and now all of a sudden you're excited. <laughs> now the people have signed this petition, most of them had kids in school or kids that were going to be in this school. And as far as your resignation from Mr. Newton concerned, I don't know why the people are arguing. We've got seven people on the board that want his resignation, and I don't know why they can't ask for his resignation and get all of this. Seeing the attitude of the people and their obvious lack of respect for um, the teachers and for them, for uh, Mr. Newton and for um, the whole educational process, it uh, made me feel that uh, even though I've uh, spent my whole life in education and teaching has been my life, I uh, I don't feel that I uh, would want to continue to teach. Um, in a situation like this. might think that your leadership is just great and another group thinks it's just terrible and that's that's really where the pinch comes I think the people around here are just so wrapped up in their own opinions that they're just beyond thinking about what it's going to do to the kids and how it's going to affect us of all of this uh, that's gone on at, at this meeting, the child has lost. The person has become so concerned with expressing a particular viewpoint that they forget the child entirely. Forget the needs of the child, forget what education is all about, why, why they are even there, why they are even in the meeting. 